going? Now we're going. There Hello. we are. You missed my ahoy. Ahoy. <laughs> ahoy to you. You weren't you. missing much. Um, super little, slick we are. Super, super slick. slick. We're a little different today. Uh, we're posting this a little later. I had a little conflict, and we're in a different location because they're working on the roof here. Yes, roof repairs. It's, it's quite noisy. It's been a good time. So, so if you hear much random... machinery working on the flat roof. If so. you hear like random hammering or drilling or whatever, that's what that is. We Hopefully you don't hear any screaming or crying or any of that sort of stuff. Not more than usual That's anyway. not a good sign on a roofing project. Right. Except for the screaming and crying I do on a consistent basis. Well, you know, that's what happens when Meyer doesn't have pumpkin spice. Can we just talk? They don't have anything. <laughs> they don't have the creamer. They don't have actual pumpkin. They don't have... Apparently they have donuts, so I'll have to look for that. It's enough to cause a riot. Oh. Like we see in Acts 19. Now that's something I can get behind. So, <laughs> the pumpkin spice riots of, of 2020. I'm going to take a big pumpkin and throw it in the window of my... <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder if these might be first world problems. But, <laughs> you know... Yeah, no. That's, somebody should make a skit out about that, like Midwestern, like suburban moms not having pumpkin spice at their Meyer, so they loot it with pump yeah. giant jack o' lanterns. I doubt that you're going to see a huge movement of protests across the nation. I'm starting it today. This, I believe. To sign my GoFundMe. <laughs> sign my petition on change.org. On behalf of the pumpkin spice culture. Yes. You'll you'll be working I, this up. I'm basic and I'm not afraid to admit it. So. Well, the reality is, regardless of whether your culture is pumpkin spice or not, the gospel of Christ and the culture of the world are in constant irreconcilable conflict. I feel like I've heard that before. Yeah, in fact, we might have seen that in Acts chapter 19. So that's probably worth discussing today. We should. That was a very bold statement. A very core, a very bold core reality. I yeah. thought, but I appreciated it because it's like. Dang, smack you in the face. I'm part of the world, so I'm in constant conflict with with the gospel of Christ based on my, my flesh. You know, that's a pretty keen observation that I, I don't know that I came away with, and I think I think you've hit on something that's significant. Each of us just in our in our that was the first thing I thought in our seen. basic uh, reality is our natural identification is with the culture. That That's who we are. The culture is made up of, of all of us. It's um, easy to say, ah, uh, the world, but you are right. part of the world. That's right. In our, in our natural state, right. that's who we are. And so when we see Paul talk, uh, like in Ephesians or elsewhere, where he talks about us being dead, being just like everybody else, that's because we, in our natural dead selves, are just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. But... He also points out that we were like that. We used to be dead in our in our transgressions. We used to be um, among them. We lived among them at one time. But now in Christ, those of us who have received him, have, have received the gospel, are not of the world. We're still here in it, but that's not where we belong. So we're no longer part of the culture. And that's part of the problem I think that we run into in the church is far too often in evangelical world we try to fit in with the culture we try to be cool we try to be like everybody else and so we want our our preaching to feel like a ted talk we want our church to feel like a, a, rock, a, concert. a rock concert a, a youth conference kind of stuff we want um, we want to fit in we don't want people to be mad at us or persecute us we you know, we, we jump on whatever bandwagon is out there. And right now, you know, I, I'm perplexed by the, the woke church movement that we're so focused on on social justice. And, and when I say just social justice, I, I mean that in opposition to biblical justice, which is mm -hmm. justice. But when we talk about social justice, we're talking about the the really the trending issues of the day that, that we're seeing specific things and it isn't specifically about justice as much as it's about the social agenda that we're working out racism is contrary to everything that is justice it's not in itself a social justice movement mm -hmm. but we've created that in in this woke culture where you're not allowed to have honest conversations. You're not allowed right. to have an honest discussion to actually try to affect meaningful change. However, we do talk about things in those terms a lot. 
So the NFL right now is seeking to enact meaningful change by putting, you know, in the uh, end zone around the goalpost and racism. Oh, well, okay. Ooh. Oh, now I get it. Yeah, I, I never saw that before. And, and I, I don't mean to make this about no, the politics of the NFL or the NBA or whatever else, but... And I'm not saying you shouldn't use your platforms for, right, for whatever. Right, for sure. I, I, I'm totally that's, in That's not a bad that. thing, but... But, we, but again, we're, we are, as a society, the 15-year-old white girl getting on Facebook to, to post about Black Lives Matter, having no concept of what's really going on while I sip my pumpkin spice latte. That's not the same thing. It's trending. It's cool. It's in. And we're fitting into the culture, not because we recognize that God has made all human beings of every skin tone to be in his image and therefore every life is sacred mm -hmm. regardless of whether you are a, an albino or the the darkest african skin tone you can find or anywhere in between red and yellow black and white all of us are precious in his sight and and when we get caught up in in whatever is the new thing mm -hmm. then justice goes out the window and this is why you're seeing a lot of a lot of black folks in America saying, wait a minute, these people don't represent me. This, you know, yes, of course black lives matter, but I don't believe in breaking up the nuclear family. I don't believe in, in you know, defunding the police. I don't believe that police are all bad, you know, that, that all cops are bad, ACAB movement, that, that whole thing, that's not based on honest, open, fully thought out discussions. Well, like it's said, based it's... on you know, some people's lived experience right. and then that becomes the only thing that matters. Right. And then the rest of the folks jumping on a bandwagon. Right, it's, and... it's what the latest trend. And it's very, I think, it's extremely dangerous to just go along with, I'm not gonna say one thing is wrong or one thing is right, but it's dangerous to go along with anything without doing your I'll own, I know you will, without doing your own deep actual right. research and that doesn't mean just oh somebody posted this on Facebook or oh I saw this article without re realizing I thought it was a fake article or whatever without doing your own research and and making your own determinations as to what is real and what is factual and what is just in right now that's extremely dangerous, and I think that's the climate that we're in right now. Hugely, with so yeah. many different issues. Right, and that's so not so many. That's issues. not unique to our no, time I know, period, I know. but I think it is exacerbated in our with time the internet period. Internet, whatever. Right, and so you know, I'll just say it. Hashtag controversy. We we are living this is in a time. Get an explicit rating. <laughs> well, the the fact of the matter is, black lives do matter. Don't do Let's, that uh, don't do this with the microphone. That makes bad noises. All black lives matter, even cops. Black lives have always mattered to every Christian who is following Christ ever in history. And I'm going to say this explicitly. Anybody who ever believed with their heart that black lives didn't matter from, from the time of the beginning until now were not walking in Christ. And the Bible is very clear about this. There's no way around it. Black lives matter matter. I will also say without any hesitation that the movement Black Lives Matter does not actually believe that black lives matter. They don't care. What they care about is their social agenda and specific and if you don't believe it, go to the Black Lives Matter website. Check them out, read their own words. What they seek to do is to upend a social structure that they believe is wrong regardless of evidence or fact. And more specifically, they, a major part of what they want to do is to destroy the nuclear family, to get rid of what they see as a patriarchal system. So all things that, that come out of, of however they would describe it in conversation, I, I don't want to get into that but because I don't want to put words in anybody's mouth, but based on their own statements, on their own website, they believe that what we value as Christ followers in a family structure that mirrors the picture that God gives us in Scripture to help reveal himself to the world through, the, through marriage, sexuality, and family, they, they are opposed to that. They, uh, 
the, the, and talking about the, when I say they specifically, I mean the movement as described by the movement. I don't mean not every Joe person down the street who has a BLM sticker. Not everybody who's right. out there saying it, because most people just don't. As as you said earlier, they don't think far enough. We don't go into the whole thing. We don't have intellectually honest conversations. So all of this is culture. Mm-hmm. Culture, regardless of, and regardless of what side of the political aisle you're on, if you are, a, you know, if you're a MAGA guy all day long, or you're, you're riding a, with Biden, or you're, you know, one of the Joe Bros, you know, you're whatever it is. Jonas Bros are going to be. Yeah, right. Uh, well, anyway, <laughs> before I go too far, uh, regardless of who you support or what you believe in. If you are primarily tied in your identity and your thinking to this world, I'm really having a hard time not pounding the table here. Um, if, if that's where you're tied, then you are in conflict constantly with the gospel. As Christ followers, we are not called to be the culture. Mm-hmm. We are not called primarily to change and shape the culture. That, that's part of our job. We are salt and light, so there should be an influence that we have, and we see that actually in Acts 19. But our job is not to clean up the kingdom of this world, but to represent the kingdom of God. Well, I was gonna, let's, let's pause on that, because it, this, it does have me thinking about the, the uh, passage from Sunday <clears throat> where they... Uh, you know, threw their scrolls into the streets, and that's right. that's a big and their and their money, and that's a big uh, statement, and that's a that's showing, hey, this is who we are, this is what we right. believe. So all this other stuff is just <coughs> garbage. So where's the line today, if we're seeing something that we as Christ followers believe to be inherently wrong within the culture? Mm-hmm. Where's the line where we just because let me say personally, I keep my mouth shut about most things, especially on social media, because I just don't want to especially deal with on social people's media, that's generally wise. whatever. I just don't want to deal with it. Right. But I generally keep my mouth shut. Um, but where is the line where this has gone too far? I need to say something or do something, even if it hasn't necessarily gone too far, which it always does. Hmm. What can I do as a Christ follower to m- make things better? Should I keep my mouth shut? Am I wrong for keeping my mouth shut and just letting this go? There's, I have a lot of questions about about when is the right time to. Right, and the do Bible something. has a lot of answers. Well, that's good. Far too many for us to cover sure, in this right. podcast. Because but. me just showing my own, you know, just just being who I am and and saying, well, that's enough. I'm a Christ follower, so I'm just gonna be who I am. And da da da. Sometimes that doesn't seem like enough. Like I'm not doing enough to to help others or to bring others out of, of what the darkness that they believe or what I feel like I'm not doing enough by just twiddling my thumbs and saying, well, I don't want to be involved in this controversy. So, yeah, I think this is a really good place for me to say, not all Christ followers think the same way on every issue all the time. I mean, I'm not throwing my stuff into the street, you know, and burning it or <laughs> like being, no. to make a statement. Streets are different now. You get well, run true. over by cars. Also, but, I think that's illegal. But. Right. But <laughs> the, um, the the idea that all Christians think alike is not accurate, well, sure, not healthy. Right, right. So it's, it's similar to all black people think alike or all Native Americans think alike or all white, all white people, people think alike. Right. They're, they're, the idea of a uniformity of thought is even when we strive for that or even when there is a, a, a dynamic of groupthink that goes on. It's still, that's just a fallacy. That's not, not reality. So when, uh, when folks think, for example, in, in civic terms, when politicians uh, think, you know, if I do this, I'm going to get all the black vote. Mm-hmm. Or if I do, you know, if I do this, I'm going to lose all the black vote. There isn't a black vote. There is, there is a preponderance of votes that come from people of a particular demographic. I, I, from a marketing standpoint, all the time, you, you have to think right. about your target audience and whether it's women at this age and or right. you know Native Americans at this But you age. also have to recognize in that you, you're targeting the, the preponderance of that particular demographic, but not everybody in that demographic fits that thought. Right. So, for example, if we were to profile you 
as a 30-something single white mother, right? Mm -hmm. If we're going to put you in this category and then say, because of that, you think X, Y, and Z based on what other people across the country think. That might completely misrepresent everything that you stand for. In fact, I would say in all likelihood it would. It usually does. And largely because these things come from a picture of worldly culture, and they don't take into account the reality of individual individuality uh, before God. And so while God deals with his people both individually and corporately, so we see that with individuals in the Old Testament, while he also deals with Israel as a whole. Same thing today. He deals with the church as a whole, with individual Christians as the, as the stones building this living temple. So it's both and. But God doesn't ever look at any of us as a cookie cutter. He doesn't right. doesn't say, well, you're black, therefore this. Right. Or you're Baptist, therefore this. He looks at that you. that would be racist. That's right. And God is not right. that. And no one who represents God is that. But racism, I, I hope I say this well. I can't say it strongly enough. But I want to. I really hope and pray that I communicate what what I'm feeling and thinking in regard to this. Racism is not wrong because we believe racism is wrong. Racism is wrong because it is a distortion of God's image and character. It is sin. It is sin when we look at anyone created in God's image as less than someone else created in God's image. It is sin when we deny that any person is not, that when we deny that they are made in God's image. It is horrific sin, and there is no way to excuse it when we say this person's life is not as meaningful as this other person's life. Therefore, because they've outlived their usefulness, we euthanize them. This unborn child is, they don't fit our agenda. This is not convenient or they weren't sired properly. Or, I mean, we just had a society that claims to care about race and yet the same folks who are pushing race as a political issue are also fighting against abortion restrictions based on race. So that, you know, when you come up with a law that says you can't abort a baby just for the reason of they're black, Oh no, we're going to fight against that so you still have the right to do that. That The inconsistency of human logic, regardless of whether you're on the left or the right or, or apolitical, the inconsistent, inconsistency of human logic is consistent. We That's the one thing we do well. We are very consistent at being inconsistent. However, God's logic, even when we don't understand it, is always right and good and pure and wholesome. And this is why Paul says in, in Philippians 4, 8, all of these things that are, are, are good and, and pure and beautiful and true and noble, all of these things is where you should focus your mind. Fill your mind with this stuff. And when you do that, then you end up seeing the dynamics of that focus play out. How does all that relate to Acts 19? So back to your question about how do we know when we should step up and when we should not step up? And this is me speaking, not the word, right. but, but informed by it. I don't think we always do. I don't think that we always can. We, As Christians, we should always stand for justice. Mm-hmm. All justice, always, all the time, everywhere. There should never be a time when we don't. We should never observe wrong uh, injustice being done to someone and, and turn a blind eye. Right. Uh, Jesus makes that clear in the in the uh, parable about the, the Good Samaritan, as we call him. So if I see a, uh, a little old lady getting mugged, I don't say, well, it wouldn't be safe for me to step in. As a Christ follower, I have to do something. Mm-hmm. Well, but you could get hurt. Yes. Praise God. I'm going to trust him to handle it. I have to do something. Whether that's make a loud noise or, or go step, uh, step in if you're in a position to do that, whatever. Uh, I'm, you, know, you and I are different people physically. As, a, as a, a woman and a man, I don't know if people realize this anymore, but there is a difference. So where I might step in and go in and try to physically intervene, maybe for you it's making a noise or yelling for a police officer. Mm-hmm. 
but we got to do something. We can't stand by while injustice happens. That happens on a, on a grand scale as well. We can't just sit around and say, well, hey, racism happens, let it go, no right. big deal. That's not a Christian approach. However, our primary goal and our primary identity is not here. Right. So we're to, to represent Christ here, which means we first and foremost, the number one thing we have to do is to live justice in our own lives. And when we are living justice, then that's the, that's the beginning of things. We have to demonstrate it. We have to model it. We have to demonstrate not only justice in, in the righteousness that, that uh, reflects how God sees people and treats people and so on, but also we have to reflect his mercy. And when we demonstrate God's mercy and we love our neighbor as ourselves, when we carry out the, the, the big commandments, number one, love God ahead of everything else. With all of your being, God. God is the priority. God is everything. And we often act like that's, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I got that. No, no, no. We don't. If you think you got it, you don't get it. This is too big a concept. Anytime anything becomes a bigger priority for me than the, the immediate imminent presence of God in my life, then I'm not carrying that out. So what I need to do is to walk with him as I go through this life. That doesn't mean I, I don't love my child mm -hmm. or enjoy a pizza or go to a movie, but he is with me, in me, through me in all of that. Because he is with me, in me, through me in all of that, then the expression of that, the natural expression of loving God with all your heart, I, I think the reason, and this is my, I guess, speculation on it, but the more I roll this over in my mind over the last half a century, the, the more I think that Jesus, when he said, the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself, I think at least part of what he means is that if you're doing the first, you can't avoid the second. Right. It's the natural outflow. It's the natural expression. And we've worded it that way a lot of times at Real Life. It's the expression of the first. But if you're not doing the second, that's an indicator that you're not. It's like the, the pH test. It's, it's that particular litmus test demonstrates whether or not you're doing the first. Well, you can't skip over one without, you know. Well, you can't. If I love God with all of my being and I want what he wants and I recognize because of that that every person is made in his image I'm going to treat them the way right. he wants them treated because they're made in his image if I'm not doing that it's a sign that I'm not living in him I'm not putting him first it's not him in me with me through me in all things and if I'm loving people but I'm not loving God then I'm faking this. I'm right. making this up from a humanist perspective that, that is, is anthropocentric, that, that says that, that humanity and man is the be-all, end-all. Therefore, I am God. We are God, and God is some smaller being that right. we've created. Uh, that doesn't work. We don't usually recognize that. We don't do these things consciously, but they are a pretty big deal. So in, I guess, the, the message of... Acts 19 in the second half, or really all of it, but in the second half, sort of to an extent is the beginning of the answer to your question of what do we do about this? How do I know when to step up, when to be vocal, when to step in? And putting what we saw last time and what we see this time together, last time we, we saw the reality that it all hinges on the person of Christ. There's no substitute for a personal relationship with God uh, through Jesus Christ. So if, if that's the key to everything, is that personal relationship with God through the, through the good news of Jesus Christ, and then being in that, we recognize that it innately sets us at odds with the natural culture. This world is not governed per se, by God at this point. It's been handed over for the time uh, to the prince of darkness, to the, the king of this world. So that we, if we're living out the gospel, will always be at odds with the culture because the culture is secular. The culture by right. its nature is anthropocentric. It, it's human-centered. So even when we're doing good, loving things and we have a certain level of popularity, a certain uh, level of 
respect or inspiration or any number of things, we find that people will love us Mm -hmm. to the extent that we fit their pre-formed image of what a a good person, a heroic person, an inspirational person um, has or does. But when we look like Jesus, the more we look like him, the more we get treated like him, which is why Matthew 10, 22, he said, you know, everyone will hate you because of me. Everyone will hate you because of me. It's not because you're obnoxious. If they hate you because you're obnoxious, it's because you're obnoxious. Right. But if you are following me, as as he uh, told his disciples in John 15, if the world hates you, remember it hated me first. You're not above your teacher. You're going to be like the teacher. The more you're like the teacher, the more you get treated like the teacher. So therefore, if we look like Jesus, then even when we have a modicum of respect in the world, even when we gain a certain amount of popularity, the more we look like him, the less that can, can be sustained. And those who truly represent Christ will become, in one way or another, polarizing figures Mm. so when he says everyone will hate you because of me he couples that with but stand firm the one who stands firm will be saved so if we're if we stand firm in the truth the world will hate us but we will be saved we'll receive the crown of life and i think of, of people like billy graham who was hated and then loved and then hated and then loved and and respected by so many people respected by people who rejected his gospel. Right. And as long as you're talking about Billy Graham, the successful speaker, great. Man, he's such a such an icon and such a, a boon to our society. If you're speaking about Billy Graham, uh, who, was, who was a Southern Democrat Baptist who at one point uh, attended Bob Jones University for a semester before going to Wheaton, I went to Wheaton, so, you know. Anyway, the, <laughs> if, if you're looking at him and him breaking down racial barriers at, at his, um, uh, at his uh, rallies, I'm running out of words now. I've used up the vocabulary for the day. Um, when he has his crusades and he, and he you know. Crusades was the word. That's the word for. I was looking for, yes. No, and he creates controversy by integrating these crusades and we say, wow, Billy Graham, he's you know, racially progressive and so on. That's all great. You have that popularity. But when you see Billy Graham as the man who says, anybody who has any, any other religion, any other hope of trying to have life apart from Jesus Christ is doomed. There's Jesus or there's hell and there's no in between. Even though he says it winsomely and gently and nicely, the more directly it is spoken, the more clear that truth becomes, the more polarizing and the more he hates it, the more people hate him. Everybody loved Tim Tebow in 2007, and he's, he's winning Heismans and national championships, and you know he's the most popular football and player even, in America. And even you know when he had the you know, John 3.16 right. or whatever on his face. That's all good. Right. Great. Until you start Until to say there's something and, more. Right. right. And so it became very polarizing. People love a winner. But people also love to see the hero fail, Mm -hmm. especially when that hero represents Christ. But it's not, it's, uh, I just was speaking with someone earlier, and we need to remember that when you are rejected because of your faith, that's not a referendum on you, that's a referendum on them. Because they are rejecting not you, but Christ. If they reject you because you're a jerk, that's a referendum on you. You know, if you... You know, if you're just mean to people, then the issue is you. It's not Christ. And I think it's one of the things I wish we could have brought up and we're we're already at the end of our time. But uh, I think far too often in evangelical world in particular, we fall into this martyrdom trap where we believe, oh, look, poor us. The whole world is out to get us. Oh, uh, you know, uh, woe is me. And there's this vast conspiracy against us. When a lot of the time it's just that you are a jerk. Stop being a jerk. Stop telling other people how to live their lives. 
2020. Stop yeah. being a jerk. There you go. <laughs> uh, stop stop trying to force unbelievers right. to act like believers right. because it makes you more comfortable. And that kind of goes back also to the question before that, that you asked about when do we stand up and when do we not. When everything we do is governed by the gospel, when our goal is to help people come into a full relationship with Jesus Christ, then that's going to lead us into the other things. You, t- you talked well, about, oh, God, sorry, go ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you know, if our, if our, if our primary purpose, as, as we would say it here at the church, is to reflect the reality of Christ through relationships, then that will guide us into the details of how we go about that mm-hmm. pretty steadily. I'm looking at your your notes from Sunday here and remembering some of the points that you had and, and you just bringing up the gospel and some of the things that, that are characteristics of the gospel mm-hmm. coming through us. And they're uncomfortable. Uh, yeah. <laughs> offend, the, the gospel of Christ offends. I don't have my glasses on. The gospel of Christ <laughs> offends. Uh, that's that's kind of where I am right now. Like I, yeah. People are offended by everything. Right, and some and things are actually offensive. No, I get that, sure. But, sure. but not very many, really. I mean, the... the and just because I'm not easily offended doesn't mean, you know, this well, dude isn't. And very true. often, the but, things that offend, it's not so much about the offensive thing as the offended person. When I get offended easily, that's, that's something I choose. Because people say sure. offensive things all the time. Right. You get to decide if you're going to have thick skin or thin skin. But the fact of the matter is... Truth will always be offensive. It'll be uncomfortable. It'll be dangerous to those who are comfortable in a lie. If, I, if I'm comfortable with the lie that this world is all there is, that you know, making more money makes me a success, that you know, whatever, that marriage is about my happiness, or that you know, smoking a joint's going to make my problems go away, or making more revenue for our village is a good enough reason to sell out our morals. Uh, the, all of those things, if I'm comfortable there, then someone coming in with truth is going to be offensive. Right. If, I, if I like my life and everything's going well and I'm, I'm doing great, but I go to the doctor and he says, I got bad news. I, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but you have stage four cancer. What? I'm I, offended by I, that. I can't have stage four cancer. Everything is going right. Everything is, you know, my life is good. I don't feel sick. Yes, but you are sick. Hmm. You don't know you're sick. But we're going to have to do something because you're going to die. That is a, a terrible truth that nobody wants to hear. So I can go with the comfortable lie or I can deal with, if I can borrow the phrase, an inconvenient truth. And, I, and if I can wade into that truth and say, you know what, this is ugly and it's painful. But now that I know, now that I deal with it, I can cut out this ugly, painful thing with the right scalpel. Mm -hmm. And because the truth is, all of us were created for a relationship with God. That's the, the reason the entire cosmos exists, is to give Him glory. And my sin keeps me from doing it. Therefore, I'm separated from him, separated from the source of life, already spiritually dead, soon to be physically dead forever, separated from God with nothing but, but the, the fruit of that rebellion for eternity. Condemnation, judgment, hell. That's, that's my reality. If I don't come to that offensive truth, then I can't ever escape the lie that is so comfortable in our culture that is normal for me. I can just live my life, get my job, marry the fine. right person, have my 2.5 kids, get the dog and the cat and you know, uh, pumpkin spice latte, and everything is good and happy. And I can ignore that, and then I end up in hell. Or I can have the offensive truth that says, you know, all that stuff is... It's fake. It seems good now, but there's no lo- if no. If you want to live in comfort now, cool, right. go for you it. Get you get what have, you choose. You have such. We have such a short window here. You know, I base it on. Oh, let's say you get a hundred years of life. Even if you do, which most people don't, but if you get a hundred years of life, that is literally a blip uh, on, on the radar when you think about eternity. And that kind of stuff 
both freaks me out and excites me at the same time. <laughs> because, I mean... And it should. I think both of those things are a little bit appropriate for us to be able to see. Because that's what brings us... That's why the, the psalmist says, teach us to number our days. Because mm-hmm. if we don't get that, if we don't realize the brevity of our life, then we won't recognize the difference between us and God. It's hard because this is all we know. Right. I mean, but it's it's certainly not permanent. But we have to come to, to terms with that. Right. We have to have the bad news. We have to have the fear of God before we can know the love of God. We have to come face to face with the, the condemnation that is ours by birthright mm-hmm. before we can recognize, I need a Savior. I need help because I can't do this. And I can't stack up my good deeds to outweigh my bad deeds. So I need somebody to rescue me. And when we recognize that God himself, the judge, has already done that in Christ, that the judge has made a way for us to have our complete penalty pay, and he's the one that paid it, that he sent his son to die for us while we were still sinners, leaving us the only responsibility of putting our hope and trust in him. That's it. That's the only thing that we have. And then because we put our hope and trust in him, because he becomes our everything, now we are for the first time able to actually submit to him. It it requires the Holy Spirit present in us for us to be able to fully submit to God. And when I walk with him in that newness of life, having died with Christ and having been resurrected with Christ, now my identity has changed. And because my identity has changed, my values have changed, my perceived purpose has changed, I now understand for the first time why I was created and I can live a life that pleases God. That's, that's good news, but that's not what the culture wants to hear. I feel like I have 20 more questions, but we are way over time. So uh, we will stop there. We probably didn't get to everything we should have gotten to, but what else is to do? Hard, hard to do that in a half hour That's or 45 minute part. Uh, so notice how I just oh, slipped wow. in 45 minutes so we can go there. Oh, and you can see. I can see. It's wonderful. Um, but now I look like I have laser eyes. <laughs> um, thank you guys for listening. As always, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to email us something real at reallifeonline.org. Uh, Leave a voicemail at the at the uh, real life uh, phone number of two six nine seven five six R L C C. Just went blank there. Right? The, <laughs> the real sentence. life hotline. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> or uh, yeah, leave us a message on Facebook or a comment or whatever. We'll get to it. Uh, we'll find it somehow. And I think that's all I have. So are you good? I'm so good. I'm so good. I'd be better if. Pumpkin spice was in the stores. Uh, hey, all I know is Jesus is coming soon. So you make me seem um, petty about um, my pumpkin spice. And we'll have a heaven full of pumpkin spice latte. I'm into it. All right, thank you guys for listening, and we will catch you later.